Greta Imsen. Hi, Misha here, and this is the gun you just saw me running a magazine through. That was from a trip last year, the kind of lost range trip where the SD card messed up, and all but a handful of clips recorded by a different device, well, went into the ether. That was my Italian Beretta Model 70, also known as the new Puma. A neat little alloy frame, single action Beretta, chambered for 7.65 Browning, 32 Auto. And this is kind of the culmination of a long development process. That's what I thought we could talk about in this video. How Beretta evolved its little 32 caliber service pistol. And these were service pistols for military and police. It started with the model 1917, sometimes called the 1915, and it progressed to the model 1922, sometimes called the model 1919, and then probably the most produced and famous, the model 19. 35. I've got two examples here, a late war and a early post-war, and how these kind of took the steps to become the Model 70, the new Puma. So with that, yeah, we'll dig into the history as usual and just have fun talking about some old 32 caliber pocket guns. This could be more interesting than you might originally think. So I do appreciate you staying with me if you do. And as always, please like, share, subscribe. And if you'd like to help support the channel, check out the link to the Patreon page. And with that, let's go back to the early early days, excuse me, of the Great War, World War I. We begin with the Beretta Modelo. 1917. At least, that's the name we kind of give it. The truth is, we don't really know of an official Italian government designation, or for that matter, know what Beretta called it internally. This is chambered for 7.65 and was Beretta's second successful pistol design. With this being the first, this is the original Modelo 1915. Again, sometimes this is called the 1915 or 1915-17. That's because of the slide legends. Brevetto basically means patent. It's not model or anything, so these are just based on the same patent. And they're based on what Tullio Maragoni produced designed for Beretta. Now, Marangoni actually started working for Beretta pretty much in his adult life at the beginning. He wasn't even professionally trained as a gunsmith or engineer. He got his job as a designer through good old-fashioned nepotism. He was friends with a family member of the Beretta family and kind of got on. Luckily, he proved to be quite good at his job, even though he was self-taught. Now, in 1910, Italy adopted a new automatic pistol, the Glycinti, 1910. And it fired the 9x19 Glycinti cartridge, dimensionally the same as Parabellum. It was about two-thirds, a little bit more powerful. I mean, less powerful. You know what I mean? Lighter loaded. Glacinti is lighter than Parabellum. The pistol was a locked breech, although a pretty light one. And Marangoni thought, well, why are we spending all this time and money to make a locked breech gun? Let's just make a simple blowback gun, kind of in the guise of the, at the time, very new 9mm Kurs 380 and 32. 
And so work would begin a little before World War One on what this pistol would become. And it was inspired by, loosely based on, the Browning 1903, Browning 1910, and the Spanish Ruby of World War I fame. Not only was the Ruby used by France, Italy also used it. It's a simple blowback gun. It has a solid frame, very much steel, no side plates, no splits, and that was done to control the cartridge. While 9mm glycinti was very anemic for a locked breech, it was at the envelope of what a direct blowback could handle. To that end, this pistol actually has a recoil buffer. <clears throat> it has, of course, its main spring with a guide rod here. And it has a, sp a spring-loaded buffer to slow down, retard the recoil as it gets towards the end of the frame. Because what will happen on a direct blowback gun, if it's too powerful, it'll crack the frame back here. So that was done to kind of keep it from doing that. It is an open-topped slide design. But quite interestingly, it has this small bridge in front of the ejection port. And the barrel simply lifts up it's not uh, terribly <laughs> secured i mean it works fine it's not going to come out on you but it's kind of based on the mauser pattern there it could have a few different styles of wood grip a heel mounted mag release some sources say that the magazine for the 1915 holds seven rounds but mine hold eight, but I have seen a few different variants. There's a, a side with a solid when holes, and then there's the open uh, side like mine here. Kind of an interesting design. And it holds open on the uh, empty, empty mag, as you see. There's your mag, your release. We actually have two safeties. We have the one here. And we have the one in the back, here, which needs to be cocked to actually engage it. Which, yeah, it's going to do that. Forward again we go. This is a little weird to operate. And, uh, yeah. So be it. A simple blowback gun firing a relatively powerful cartridge. So testing throughout 1915 was underway at Beretta, and this was iconic for the co the company, and while I'm taking a little time with it, because it was their first pistol. Before that, Beretta not only did not design military pistols, they really weren't even to, into military guns much. They mostly did sporting shotguns and rifles. But the Marangoni's design here kind of changed that, and it's really what saw Beretta through World War I. It was adopted as a substitute standard, the glass and tube still being the standard, in November of 1915, with an initial order for 5,000, which were delivered the next year. The military would place two more orders for 5,000 for a total of 15,000, and these would be issued to the army as well as police. How many were built in total? Well, we know production, it would end in 1918. Some sources say the number was as low as 15,300. Other sources claim as high as 15,700. The additional pistols, there were a few hundred for the commercial market. And some say there was a small final contract for around 300 in 1918. The point is, pretty small production run. That's because this was... Not a bad pistol, but firing 9 by 19 glycinti made it rather big and heavy, gave it a rather sharp recoil impulse, and again, you're kind of pushing the envelope of what it could handle. However, with the 1917 here, Beretta kind of got smart. After the initial success of the 15, 
work would go, get underway in 1916 to scale it down to fire 32, which was becoming a very popular self-defense round in the trenches of World War I. It allowed for very simple, dependable guns. They weren't as susceptible to, to mud. This uh, pistol was tested in the summer of 1917, adopted in September of that year, and the first ones were delivered in December. And the initial order was for 10,000, again going to the military, the army, as well as police. And even though production would only last through 1919, Beretta would crank out over 55,000. And they were able to get so many out so quickly because of how simple this little gun is. It took the best features of the 15 and kind of scaled it down to about three quarters size. This is about 25% smaller than the 15. Whereas the 15 had a four inch barrel, this has about a three and a half. The design does not need the secondary buffer spring, so that's gone. They did away with the secondary safety back here, which to be fair was pretty pointless. Still have the primary safety. Still internal hammer fired, single action. This one has the wood grips. There's a few different styles. Still has the angled mag catch down here with just a smaller version of the same mag. And has the same open topped slide with the bridge in front of the ejection port. And the barrel comes out much the same way. One fun fact with the 1917, to simplify things, your firing pin doubles as your ejector. Kind of, um, yeah, we have an extractor here, but the ejector is your firing pin, which I guess it worked, but that seems like there'd be hell on your firing pin tip. But much is the testament to Beretta's quality overall. And the triggers on these are um, fine. Safety works. As you see, well, I guess you don't because it's on the other side. Let me try that again. <laughs> Easy to flick off. Pretty ergonomic location for World War I. Heavy trigger, but that was mostly done for safety's sake. And these would continue after the military had enough what Beretta had left, kind of building from leftover parts. These would be in their commercial catalog through about 1922. Some would be given away to allies later on. I and mean, they had over 55,000, so yeah. And others would stay in the Italian armed forces through World War II, although weren't terribly common. But there was a, a nice little durable gun a lot lighter and smaller than the uh, 1915 here. This is a pretty hefty gun, frankly. All steel and you got a four inch barrel. This little guy is just under six inches. When does that quite felt? Well, a lot of companies did not develop much in the 1920s and Beretta would slow things down but they would continue working on their successful pistol. Next up, between 1920 and 1922, we move away from the original design here to the first kind of major update, at least in 7.65 millimeter. Again, based on the patent marking on the slide, 1919, this is sometimes called a 1915, 1919, but as much as there we can tell, the official name is model 1922, the unofficial official name. And the reason we have a new patent, or at least in addition to the patent, is we are going to a new system. This barrel 
is retained with more of a wedge system unique to Beretta. They're kind of getting away from borrowing from Mauser to doing their own thing. And we have a new open top slide. There's no distinguishing between ejection port and barrel now. And this was done for a few different reasons, including, you know, accommodating the barrel system. We also have a new version of the safety slide stop. We can take the mag out, and it still holds open auto, uh, manually. They also redid the, slide, the sights in the back a bit. A little bit of flat top here. Still internal hammer. And still about a 3.5 inch barrel. And notice this has metal grips, which is really cool. I'll be honest, when I picked this pistol up a long time ago, it was the metal grips that first attracted me to it. I don't know. It's kind of neat. Some World War I Berettas would have metal grips too. So it was just kind of the next evolution. Some improvements for reliability, durability, and to ease manufacturing. And this would appear around 1922. And as best we can tell, based on serial numbers, for the next decade, they would build about... 43,000 and some would go to the Italian Navy many would go to the Italian Army and others would go to the Italian police and this would also be made commercially available at least in some numbers because again we're in this post-war period this is the beginning of Mussolini's reign yeah, Beretta is needing to essentially earn their keep. And that would lead to our next major step forward. Meet the Modelo 1923. And for once, we have a real official name. In fact, this was the first one to come out of the gate with an official name and designation. Because with this, Beretta was hoping to get some military contracts. And feeling that they were more apt to buy the larger caliber, this is a return to Glycenti and by 19. And it is very much like the 1915, even taking the same type of mag. Mags are updated a little bit, but they are more or less interchangeable. This could be had with these pressed steel grip panels or wood panels. And of course, its major uh, improvement... is the external hammer. This kind of takes the place of the safety on the original gun. It uses essentially the same safety system but in reverse to the 1919 patent 1922 model. Locking back there. And we have an open top, and you push the barrel in for disassembly. See, same basic mag. Oh, cool. Mine's auto disassembling barrel. <laughs> Sometimes when these get stuck, they're hard to do. Other times they want to come right out. Essentially, they're just friction fit. But they're held in by this uh, safety catch, so it only can do that when the mag is out. And uh, you run that. I guess we can call it a disassembly notch. Right here. See, no problems. And we're back. Single action only. Another change they made here to both, really to simplify production to be honest with you, instead of having the spring-loaded buffer in the back, it has a nylon kind of buffer plug to help with the, uh, the recoil. Because again, we're fine, Glycenti. Obviously, no mag disconnect safety. And one inner, you know, one feature that was introduced here that will be carried over is this rounded mag catch. Still very much a heel mounted, but a little more ergonomical. 
So this was introduced in 1923, and Beretta was really pushing hard for the Italian military to adopt it. And they really only bought them in small numbers because they were, frankly, cash-strapped. About 3,000 would be acquired over the next decade. The largest contract actually was from Romania, who would purchase around 4,000. And the remaining guns would be privately sold, commercially sold. Best estimate, 10,400 were built. There was even an option in the catalog for a detaching shoulder stock, which mine doesn't have the slot for. But it was an option. Shoulder stocks were kind of all the rage in the, the 1920s. So in some ways, this was kind of a backward-looking design, being chambered for glycinti, big and heavy. But in others, it was really forward-thinking, with the exposed hammer, the updated mag catch, and continuing the use of the new pattern of barrel mount that, frankly, would continue throughout the entire series. Next, we jump forward a bit to the Modelo 1931. And that's not a pistol that I have, because only about 6,500 were built for just a couple of years. And it's often called the Navy pistol because, well, most went to the Navy. Basically, the 31 was a Modelo 1923, but scaled back down to 1922 size. So basically, think of a 1922 with the exposed hammer, the updated... Uh, mag release, and as far as I know, the 31s had wood grips. You know, still about the same size and dimensions and all that good stuff. And then those would quickly be superseded during testing and what have you, by the model 1932. Now I've got my 35 out here, because you'll notice it has a more rounded grip, a different angle. And that was the major difference between the 31 and the 32, was a reshaped, more ergonomic grip. Otherwise, basically the same gun. And they would only build about a thousand, and most, if not all, were sent to the government for testing. And again, a majority of those went to the Navy. A few did squeak out to other places, including the police. And basically it was the model 1932 that was the basis for what was going to come next. Now one thing about me, I don't own any 380 guns, just how I am. So I'm pulling this one out of the store, it came in, I apologize for the, let's say, well used and loved finish on it, but it's an example of a model 1934, which was Italy's official army service sidearm from 1936 all the way up until 1991, at least in some capacity, believe it or not. And production would last all the way up through 1980. So, in 1935, the Italian military adopted 9mm Corto. Now, this was nothing more than 380 9mm Kurs, 9x17 Browning, what have you. And this was a compromise cartridge between 32 and 9mm glycinti. And they, of course, needed a new pistol to fire it. So what Beretta did, they upscaled the 1932 to fire 9mm. And they also went to a new style of grip. They went away from wood to kind of Bakelite. And what's neat about these grips, they have steel back plates. And that's particularly good on this pistol, because one of the grips, as old Bakelitis want to do, is, uh, is cracked. But, because it has the steel back plate, it's still nice and tight. Smart idea. They also updated the markings a bit, and a few other minor changes. They also added a half cock to the hammer system. Like shown both of these. Something that the previous 1923 pattern did not have. So, the first guns ordered by the government were about a thousand 1934s ordered for the police, the public security, in 1935. 
The next batch, which was even smaller, only 250 guns, was ordered for the port guard, the port security, basically the customs police. But at the same time, the army was trying these out, and in June of that year, they expressed extreme interest in the pistol, and they dangled the large order in front of Beretta for 150,000 pieces. But they wanted some changes, including a firing pin safety. But at the end of the day, it was going to cost more money and more time. They decided to just kind of roll with what Beretta was offering. Thus, on October 16, 1936, the Modelo 1934 was adopted as the Army's new official standard issue sidearm. And this would actually relegate over half a dozen older designs from the Bodio to the Glycenti to the Brixia to other Berettas like the 1915, 1917 out of frontline service. Kind of standardizing everything into one basket. And by December, the very first pistols were delivered, and by 1937, they were seeing some, some field juice. And this was a big contract, but it would get even bigger. Between 1938 and 1940, nearly 250,000 more pistols would be ordered, and then throughout World War II, even more than that. <laughs> so, it was really taking off for, uh, for Beretta. So what about the Modelo 1935? Now, Beretta considered the 34 a new gun, maybe in the spirit of the 15 and the 23, but it had its own new serial range. But the 35 was considered a continuation started back with the 17, the 22, the 31, and the 32. And 32 caliber had been a very popular choice for Beretta. And the Italian Air Force and the Navy, who had acquired newer pistols in the Army, wanted to keep on using 32 for various reasons, as did many police and some private parties, civilian purchasers. So Beretta would essentially rework the 34 into the 35. It has the same features. The only difference, its magazine holds eight rounds, whereas the 34s holds seven because of the thicker cartridge. By the way, these have about uh, 3.7 inch barrels. Again, single action only. Have a 180 degree safety hold open here on these. Kind of interesting. Still basic system, disassembly is the same. We have the more ergonomic angle, lanyard loop of course, and notice we have the rounded mag release of the 23, or at least introduced by the 23. So the 35 was essentially put into service right after the 34 and would be ordered by the Air Force and the Navy. Now the Air Force and Navy would have some 34s. There are guns marked with the RM or the RA or the RE for really all of these. But production would be more weighted towards the Corto gun. That said, this would actually be a more popular export for Beretta. Some were sent to Finland. There was a large Romanian contract as well. But you know who else preferred? 32 over 380? Mm, Hitler. This is a new one to my collection that I haven't shown you before. And back to the 34. Now, the Germans did use some of the 380s. In fact, they called it the Pistol 671i. Now, this all kind of comes back to 1942-43. Those were the highest years of production for these guns. 
and in 43, Mussolini was being deposed, and in September, Italy signed a treaty with the Allies. But the Beretta factory was in the north, and it fell under more or less direct Nazi control under a puppet regime, and production would continue. But in December of 43, the Nazis would order that 34 production be halted, and that Breda should focus on the 35s. Now, Breda was, of course, allowed to continue assembling 34s from existing parts. And so we do st still see some uh, Nazi marked and era guns up through 1945, and they would have about 53,000. But yeah, the 35 was their main focus. And the reason that the Germans, that Hitler, that was their standard cartridge, frankly. While they did field some 9mm Kurz guns, 32 7.65 was kind of their substitute standard round after 9mm Luger. And they would build over 92,000 of these for the Nazis or under Nazi what have yous throughout 1943, 44, and into 45 before the Allies came. And there can be some really interesting markings on these guns. Uh, 4UT is often one you encounter. This was actually an Italian proof. But some would have Waffen amps. There could be WA162. Even some had swastika proof markings. Others would not, though. You would also see some era... Between 19, uh, there was one kind of period in 1943 where there wouldn't be much of anything marked on the slide, and then late guns in 45 would not have anything marked on the slide. In addition, beginning in 1944, the fit and finish really took a turn downward. It had been, of course, gradually declining throughout the war, but under Nazi control, we went to what's known as the wartime finish. You would have rough blowing with little polishing done, gouges and tool marks like you see on this pistol. Even some phosphating would start to be used. Grip panels would remain more or less unchanged, unlike a lot of places they didn't go to wood panels. And they did simplify the magazine, going to a simple stamped base plate versus milled or machined. But overall, the pistols, while they lost a little bit in fit and finish, still were, you know, quality guns. They were safe to shoot, and uh, still plenty reliable. Just made in a hurry. And of course, once the Allies came in, Beretta would continue production, and that's actually where this pistol's from. It was built in 46, I believe, and it is built from some wartime era parts, but it has the return to the high degree of fit and finish. You can really tell on the uh, mag release here, nicely serrated. If you look at this one, it is um, not as nicely evenly serrated. <laughs> So yeah, and production would continue for the police, as well as the Air Force and Navy, and sometimes the uh, the Army. And like I said, Romania would order over 60,000, but only about 40,000 of the uh, 34s would be delivered, and 35s. Finland would also acquire some. They would get around 1,500 34s, but they would get over 4,000 35s, they, they tended to prefer, well, frankly, neither, because Finland can be snobs like that, but they had more of the 35s. And these were used by Italian forces and their allies all over the place, North Africa, Europe, of course, and even on the Eastern Front with Russia. It was not the most powerful pistol, no matter the caliber, and it wasn't the most accurate pistol. We have fixed iron sights. And we have a, 
a trigger more geared towards safety than anything else. But the trade-off, it was light, extremely easy to clean, maintain, terribly durable. Again, even the grips had metal backing. The magazines were reliable. It was just easy to carry around. It has a nice feel and point to it. And it, it, it was very well respected. It had a good reputation during the war. And many were brought home as war trophies. Either through active combat or through allies, soldiers. They were serving as part of the occupation force uh, in 1945, 1946. That time period. After the war, production would continue on both models. While Beretta would continue to send some to the Italian military, they would turn more and more to the commercial market. Even a new name was given in the 1950s as M934 and M935. And while the 34 was less than warmly embraced, the 35 was still very well received by police and some private parties. I think that's because if, if uh, someone wanted a 9mm gun, at this point they were going to go with something in uh, 9mm Luger, kind of skipping over 380. But if they really wanted something small and handy to shoot, 7.65 Browning was still about the best choice around. Certainly uh, more going forth than, say, 25 ACP 7, excuse me, 6.35 Browning. So this gun was uh, pretty commercially successful for Beretta after the war. The Italian army would continue to issue the 1934, like I said, up until 1991, and Beretta wouldn't officially shut down the production line until 1980. And when they did, it was estimated that about 1,080,000 had been built in total, making it the most produced Italian firearm of World War II, and frankly, one of the most produced handguns of World War II in general. And now we cycle back around to where we began. When Beretta was marketing the 35 in America, it sometimes would use the name Puma. It's also worth saying that before and during World War II, these were known commercially as the Jekka or Gecko in Germany too, so they were also exported commercially there. But anyway, that's where the Puma name comes from, is the 1935. And Breda would keep producing these up until around 1967, at least that's when they would be removed from the catalog. I would imagine the last few years they were just using up, you know, old parts. But, in 1958, they would introduce the Model 70 here. And since we began with Tullio Marangoni, it is worth pointing out that he passed away the, the, the year before, 1957, and it said this was the last pistol that Beretta released that could have had some input from him when it came to its design, although I would imagine his input was very small, very limited to say the least, but it is possible. And this was designed to replace this. Now during World War II and afterwards, Beretta had experimented with alloy frames, this is a steel frame. While it's a small gun, it's a little bit on the heavy side, and alloy was becoming quite popular in the 1950s. Note work over at Walther. So with the Model 70 here, it was released with either a steel or an alloy frame, and this is an alloy frame model. And when it was first released, it was chambered in 32. 7.65. Later, 380 versions, 25, 22 versions, and others would join the lineup, usually getting a, a separate name like 71, 72, 73, etc. And this is a pretty radical step forward, not just in the construction of the frame, but everything else. We have a new mag release down here. Now, this might seem like an awkward location today, but when this was released, Beretta touted it is a pretty good step forward. 
And if you think about the heel release, uh, it, it certainly is. It's not the worst in the world, but now we have what is effectively a drop-free mag and also in a position where your hand is naturally down there to catch it. They also went to a new mag style, finally kind of getting away from the open-sided version. They went to some wraparound grips. Earlier ones like these are more of a reddish brown Bakelite. Later they would go to more of a black plastic. And they would introduce a new safety here. Kind of a cross button kick. Kind of reminds me of what you would uh, see on a shotgun. Again, a definite improvement over the safety here with this long throw. Also, really for the first time on a production Beretta 32, we have a true last round hold open. We still have the open top slide. That's something Beretta still even does today. But when you drop the bag, your slide stays open. Moreover, we actually have a release control here. Mine's a little stiff. Nothing extraordinarily new to us today. You know, back then, it was a definite ergonomic step forward. Still have the side, the sides mounted on the slide. Still have a similar single action trigger. The lock work has been updated for reliability, safety, and uh, durability. Still have half cock. We do have more of a, a true firing pin block in here as well. At least we would get one with the later M70s. And we have a redesigned trigger guard. You get the idea, I believe. Now this wasn't really introduced for the Italian military. The Army was happy with its 34s. The Air Force was still mostly hanging out with 35s. And the Navy, at least in part, had adopted the new Modelo 1951. Beretta's first lot breach. Now, this was targeted at the commercial market, being named the new Puma in America. By the way, the 1934 was known as the Cougar. <laughs> and it was targeted at Italian police. And the Italian police actually did purchase it in quite large numbers in the 1960s. A handful of military units like special forces would buy a few of these when they needed a concealable weapon, for example, Navy Special Services. But yeah, Italian military use of the 70 was very limited. On the other hand, a major export customer was Israel. The Israeli police would buy these in large numbers, as would the Israeli IDF, Again, for use with special forces. The Mossad also purchased some Berettas, although they tended to prefer the 22. They did have some of the 32s as well. So, it was really one of the last blowback small frame pistols from Beretta that would see significant military police use. After this, things like the Cheetah, well, they would see use. It's kind of dropping off, and by that point, the system's getting even further and further away from the original. In the early 70s, the Model 70 itself here would be replaced by the 70S, which had a more traditional safety, and they would rework some things like the grips and slide catch, basically things to make it look less like a baby 1951, <laughs> which is kind of what I like about it. And I really like shooting this gun. It's comfortable in the hand. The wraparound grip is uh, has a good contour to it. Trigger is fine for what it is. And it's a worthy successor in this, uh, this whole lineup, this whole family. And it's really kind of fun to have them all. And there we have it. A, a somewhat brief, I should say, <laughs> 
development history of the little Beretta pistol. And because these were primarily made, especially in the beginning, for military police users, that does give them a lot more interesting things to dig, dig into. It also makes things interesting because, as I said, for the first couple of models, there really wasn't an official name or designation. <laughs> makes it uh, kind of interesting there. And it really was a standard service gun for decades. And, you know, for Italy's needs, it, along with the 9mm Quarto, the 380, served well. And, of course, by the time of the Model 70 here, it was falling out of military use, although it would still serve police and American shooters alike up to this point, up to this time. Uh, while most police departments have finally retired their old 32s, plenty of us in America still enjoy shooting them. And this is kind of one of those retro modern guns. It's still a lot of fun to take to the range. And as you saw at the beginning of the video, mine is still perfectly reliable with modern ammunition. And thanks to the frame, it's a lot of fun. Trigger's not bad for a military trigger, either. Well, I hope you did find this interesting. Breda pistols have always kind of been a little bit of a passion of mine. Maybe not quite as much as, say, Walther's, but interesting nonetheless. And, at least up until recent times, very affordable. There's a lot of bring back 1934s and 35s in America, although the older guns can be harder to find. And, of course, quite a few new Pumas, M70s, 70Ss were imported back in the 60s and 70s here and sold commercially, too. So... That might be something to check out if you're interested. I don't uh, I don't think you'll be disappointed. Breda's reputation definitely precedes itself. Well, if you have any questions, comments, or if you own any of these, we'd love to talk about it in the section below. As always, if you could, again, please like, share, subscribe. And if you'd like to help support the channel, check out the link to our Patreon page. This is Misha. Catch you very soon next time.